All right. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. And uh, welcome to the second of our Women Who Changed the Discussion webinar series um, from Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland and uh, supported by uh, 20 by 20. Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland is comprised of Ed Collin, Phil Carney, Alan Dunton, and myself, Ollie Logan. And we're passionate about skill acquisition, coaching science, and youth development. And we hope that by hosting these webinars, we're able to connect you with some of the leading figures in these respective areas. So some of you might be aware, our first webinar series ran from April to June of this year, and you can check those out on our YouTube channel. So the name of that YouTube channel is in the uh, bottom right in, in this holding screen. Um, and it, you might remember from that, some of you might have joined us that our first speaker that uh, in the webinar series was a former Irish field hockey captain and current England under 18s coach, Sarah Kelleher. Um, and in the lead up to, and, and even during the, um, the webinar that she spoke at, Sarah spoke really passionately about the need for greater efforts to raise the profile of female coaches. Um, and she said that in, the, in, in that webinar and also in the, um, in the interview that she did with in the Irish Examiner. Examiner. And she said, we need more stories, more voices. And in response to Sarah's call, we've decided to go with the theme of women who've changed the discussion for our second season. As I said before, we're fortunate to be supported by the 20 by 20 campaign, which is here in Ireland. And if you haven't seen that, just 20 by 20 is a campaign to try and increase and get 20% more media coverage of women in sport, 20% more female participation at a player, coach, referee and administrative level, and 20% more attendance at women's games and events. If you haven't seen that or you want to check out more, then go to 20by20.ie and you'll be able to find more on their website. A little bit of housekeeping from my end before we hand over to Ed to introduce today's speaker. So uh, if you are on the webinar, then please keep yourselves on mute um, just, to, just to limit any noise. Um, and if you do have questions, feel free to put those in the chat box in uh, the Zoom call. If you're watching us on YouTube Live today, because we're, we're going out streaming out on YouTube Live, then feel free to put the comments in or the questions in the comments section and we'll pick those up as well. And uh, we'll then give Q&A to our guest today after the uh, presentation. So that's everything from me. Ed, i uh, hand over to you to introduce today's speaker. Great, Ali, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to everyone, uh, those who are new to us, but also welcome back to those who've been with us before. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Nicola Hodges, and it is a huge honor for us because as Ali said, um, we, we in Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland, we cover a number of bases and a number of interests. And there are very few people who have published as widely and as broadly and as deeply as uh, Professor Nicola Hodges. And so Nikki, thank you so much for coming on. It is, as I said, it's a huge pleasure because of how expansive your work has been at, over the last 20 years with publications in all of the leading sports science and skill acquisition uh, journals, but also for the work you've done as a lead editor in arguably the most important book in skill acquisition uh, for our domain, which is Skill Acquisition um, Research Theory and Practice that you that you edit with, with the help of uh, Professor Mark Williams. And it's the fantastic thing about that book for anyone who hasn't seen it yet it is now in its third edition, but uh, it has, changed so much in a, such a positive way with each edition because the domain is moving so fast and so quickly. What you've done as an editor is, is fantastic to keep everyone up to speed with what, what those changes are. Um, but also outside of all of that work around publication, you are known uh, globally also as someone who really pushes the domain. And I was fortunate enough myself to to be present at the pre-NASPA um, symposium that you and Joe Baker did in 2016 in Montreal. And it still is spoken about as one of the, one of the best symposiums for skill acquisition because of the, the, again, the content that you guys invited in for presentation, but also the atmosphere that you guys had at, on that occasion to really spread the word of skill acquisition and also recognize some people who are also doing great work that like the likes of Rob Gray. And so it is a genuine, if you're, if we're having a, a, a webinar series, women, women who change the discussion, it's a no brainer for us to have 
gone after you in the hope that we could secure you for the next hour. Um, so, Nikki, thank you and welcome. Okay, Nikki, you can uh, you can share your screen now. Over to you. Uh, yeah, I don't have the controls. Hang on a second. There we go. All good. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for those kind words, Ed. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to give this talk today, um, especially because you are um, acknowledging women, both in the skill acquisition uh, field and coaching. But also, I think I would really like to spread the word to, uh, to those fellow researchers out there that this is a really fantastic area of study and there's so many exciting questions uh, to be asked. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about skill acquisition in sport. I've entitled my talk Mirrors, Models and Masters mostly to reflect the fact that I have been looking at observational learning and demonstrations for a number of years now and I'm particularly interested in some of the research that's come out from uh, the mirror neuron system and its implications for action simulation. And the master's reference uh, refers to the, um, my research on expert performance. So let me just make sure I'm gonna just get rid of my meeting controls here, good. Oh, now I can't move the screen down. So at UBC is, is uh, where I'm situated in uh, Vancouver, Canada, and I run the motor skills lab there. And I basically study anything to do with practice. Uh, I typically do experimental research where we try and isolate variables. And um, I use any task to sort of address the problem. If I get the chance, it usually involves kicking a ball or something to do with soccer, but not necessarily. I, I always think that, you know, you have a question and you're trying to find um, a solution, which is a task to the problem. So whatever you have at hand to address those questions. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk to you about these global research questions that have influenced my research. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the theoretical influences and then I'm going to uh, take you through some empirical progressions, really focusing on what I'm doing now, but just a little, a little bit of where I started. And uh, I'm also going to um, end, because uh, Ed told me I had to leave about 30 minutes to questions. So I think I'm on about 30, 35 minutes for today. So hope you can stick with me. I do appreciate this is a Friday night for many of you. So the first question, um, that has been of interest to me are what are the processes underpinning learning and predicting for, from others? And I'm just going to show you a quick video here. This is my daughter Mira, who's just learned to unicycle. Um, so I've been really interested in what happens when we watch other people perform actions. Um, how engaged is our own motor system when we're watching others perform? Especially if we're trying to learn, what are we picking up? Are we trying to pick up strategies that maybe notice that there's a lot of arm movement going on um, and how much is experience dependent. We do know from research that when people watch demonstrations, they actually show this sort of incremental um, belief in their ability to do something. And if they try something and fail, then when they get to try again, uh, if they get to see an observation, first of all, their confidence increases. And this has been some research I had done with juggling with Tom Coppola, and there's, there's also some other, other evidence on that domain. So the, the three sort of more specific questions I've uh, been asking related to observational learning are how similar or different is observational practice from physical practice? How do our physical experiences impact what we see and our predictions? And what are the implications for different processes for training? So in terms of sort of theoretical influences, I have been interested in this idea of action simulation that 
when we watch other people that we um, are engaging covertly in the same action. Our own motor system gets engaged to help us see and predict. So what we actually see is somewhat dependent on what we can actually do. And this has been really influenced by uh, neurophysiological research on the mirror neuron system or what's more recently called the action observation network that there are actually shared pathways between observation and action. So that when we uh, perform an action, you see uh, similar areas involved that are there when we're actually just observing somebody else perform that action. There's a really good Nova Science Now video if people don't know about the mirror neuron system uh, that I would recommend you having a look at. Um, <clears throat> I know it's on YouTube. So this is the idea then that our brain or our system is prepared to execute the same or potentially a complementary action as observed. And I've been really interested in the boundary conditions uh, for activation of our motor system when we're watching other people, particularly when we're trying to learn because then we don't have those motor experiences. The second question that I've been interested in are what type of practices um, or what types of practice sorry, are best for learning and um, how do these practice experiences uh, predict success in, in sport? So really sort of what are the experiences that lead to expertise and some of those pathways? I'm not going to talk about my research on um, practice conditions today. If you're interested, I am um, doing some research at the moment on social motor learning. This was April Kalinsky's uh, PhD thesis, if you want to check out some of those references. Uh, but I will talk a bit about the expertise pathways at the end. In terms of theoretical influences, you know, I was thinking about this, that many of the conditions that I study, some of the mechanisms involved, I think, are quite nuanced and, it's, and, and different. So it's sometimes quite hard to um, say, you know, there's one theory that fits everything. But I do think the challenge point framework provides a nice framework or summary of um, the important um, mechanisms underpinning good practice. And I know as coaches uh, to actually have some kind of framework to hang on to, um, to guide practice is, is um, a useful, useful starting point to sort of consider practice principles. So for those of you who don't know, the challenge point framework was proposed by uh, Mark Guadagnoli Oli and Tim Lee in 2004. And this is the idea that an optimal level of cognitive effort or challenge is needed for learning. So um, what this means really is that if you practice and you're performing well, hang on, sorry, just my screen is behind the video. If you're practicing and you're performing well, um, there's no new information for you to learn from. So you want to get to a situation where there's either um, some errors, um, that something new is brought into the environment, and particularly something unexpected. We know from research, from computational research, from sensory processing, that our system really cares about unexpected events. So the challenge point framework talks about this idea that during practice, you want to go from suboptimal challenge, where you're performing in a comfort zone, to an area of optimal challenge, which is going to maximize learning. And, you know, this, this is related to the goals of practice, whether you want to maintain, whether you want to improve. And I also think it can be situated in terms of maximizing transfer to competition. Oh, in again. Excuse me, sorry, it's a glitch here. There we go. So the challenge point framework is also um, highly linked to the deliberate practice framework. And this has had a big influence on my research since I came out to Canada in 1993, which was the same time that Ericsson proposed the deliberate practice uh, theory based on his work with musicians. And unfortunately, and has passed away this year, but you know, this is over 25 years and this research is still going strong. So he's had a massive impact on our field. For those of you who don't know, 
Deliberate practice theory is that um, to acquire expertise, it requires dedicated, deliberate or purposeful practice. And again, the emphasis is on this effortful practice and time, maybe working on weaker skills, which is needed for skill development. Feedback is really important, important factor for learning progressions. And what came out of this early research is that it's this self-directed practice that comes from a self-directed motivation to purposely engage in practice, improve, improve and attain expertise. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk you through some uh, empirical progressions and give you a little bit of history and talk, you, talk about some current research. This first question, what are the processes underpinning learning and predicting from others? I'm gonna divide it into two topics. The first one is how do demonstrations or observational learning work to constrain and encourage learning? So this began uh, originally when I went out to McMaster University in Canada. I was a researcher student with Tim, research assistant with Tim Lee for a year before I came out to UBC to do my PhD. And he started using the bimanual coordination paradigm to look at practice conditions. And I was really interested in this paradigm to study how instructions, uh, demonstrations and feedback actually shape behaviors. And the nice thing about this paradigm is that you know that people bring to the task existing skills or habits, such as this preference to do in-phase or anti-phase. And then you can look to see um, how you can encourage behavior change through demonstrations and instructions um, and whether there are actually some benefits from giving people instructions or whether it may hinder learning. And in some of this research, I was surprised to find that when we gave people demonstrations and they had to learn this complex 90 degree coordination task, it actually seemed to interfere. They were picking up a strategy that got them more sort of stuck in a previous um, behavior. So this really relates, I think, to technique change, that uh, the demonstrations was telling them what to do, but what they were picking up from it is what not to do, which was in phase, and it got them stuck doing an undesired uh, behavior. And we found that if we just gave people um, sufficient constraints in terms of feedback, you know, we want you to make the circle task go ahead, given that the task was so constrained that this was sufficient to bring about learning. Um, so, you know, interestingly, this is sort of where I started, which uh, was really using these dynamical systems paradigms to look at learning. And it did make me really consider when we need to give instructions and when we should be more hands off in, in giving instructions and really think about what that information is telling you to do. Also, one of the interesting things here was that when people could perform the movement pattern, um, they were very free with their instructions. So once they had learned what to do, they would say, oh yeah, you just need to do A, B, C, D. But beforehand, they didn't have that understanding. They would watch somebody do this coordination pattern and they really just had no understanding of what they were seeing. And I think this really goes to show how um, your motor experiences shape your understanding, which has led to a lot of the research I've been doing now, looking at observational learning and how important the motor system is in um, our um, learning from observation or whether learning is perhaps more strategic in nature. So I've been using this adaptation paradigm where people um, learn to move in these sort of immersive, immersive environments and there are, um, as they make a movement, it's actually uh, rotated in some way or there's some kind of perturbation. So they have to learn a new coupling between their actions and the visual output. This task is really interesting because you can separate more explicit strategic processes from those that are more implicit and that speak to perhaps motor system involvement. So I'm just gonna show you what this um, may look like. In a normal aiming, you would see uh, a target light come on. Um, it would be say, for example, target number five. You don't usually see your hand and um, under normal conditions, your hand would move towards the target and the cursor would also move towards that target. And then in a rotated condition, this is for example, 30 degrees clockwise aiming, target three would come on. Uh, and in order to get your 
cursor moving to the target, your hand has to go counterclockwise to the target. And people learn to do this. And we were interested if people learn to do this when they are observing this dissociation between the hand and the cursor. What's really interesting is if you put people back into these normal environments after they've had practice, you say, OK, there's no no perturbation, no rotation now. Everything's just normal. Please just aim to target number three that you continue to see these um, biases, which are called unintentional after effects. So we wondered whether observers show these unintentional after effects from watching other people and whether they're going to learn in a more direct fashion. So this was some work with Nicole Ong and this is directional error on the y-axis here and these are the phases of um, practice. So first of all, we, we test um, individuals in a normal environment. They show very low error as you would expect. And then we had, this was a live observation period. So people were watching as the person was adapting to this environment. And so you only get this performance curve for the physical practice individual who gets better over time. The observer obviously is not doing anything. And then we, then we say, okay, we're just going to test you again in this normal environment. And we don't see any after effects for observers, large after effects for the physical practice participants, which is common. But importantly, these observers had learned. So if we measured them in this rotated environment, they show direct benefits from practice. So it suggests that this observational learning was more strategically mediated and didn't seem to engage the motor system. It, there wasn't evidence that their planning processes were updated just merely as a result of watching somebody else, even though they're watching with this intention to learn. <clears throat> So we asked the question, OK, so it seems that you can learn through both ways. There's different processes engaged in how you learn from observation versus physical practice. Maybe this motor system um, involvement is less than what other people have proposed. But perhaps there could be some benefits of having um, physical practice and observational practice. So we said, we, we looked at the literature and there's evidence that if you have to acquire a number of skills um, back to back, you see interference in your retention of those skills. So we thought, okay, what about if you acquire one skill through physical practice and one skill through observational practice? If di different mechanisms are involved, you should be able to um, retain both skills quite well. And basically that's what we showed. So I'll just walk you through the graph here. This is error on the y-axis, and this is just the retention data. So we had all groups practice task A, which was a clockwise rotation. And then one group, the group in blue, the physical practice group, practiced task A, had a short rest, then practiced a counterclockwise rotation, and we were interested to see how well they could perform on both these tasks in a later retention test. The second group physically practiced task A and then just observed task B, that's in orange. And the control group physically practiced task A and then didn't do task B at all. And you can see the data here. This is what's happened now when we test them again on the first task and the second task. Huge interference for the physical practice group in remembering task A. So this is retrograde interference. We don't see that for the observation group or the control group, because obviously they didn't do anything in that interval. Importantly, importantly though, the observation group had learned task B. They showed low error on the task and low interference. So it suggests that mixing observation with physical practice helps retain different skills without interference. Uh, this is some newer research that uh, we've only just submitted. And um, we've been asking whether if you intersperse physical practice and observation, does it change the nature of observation or could it potentially have some benefits for learning? There's a lot of data here. So I'm just going to direct you to the right side of the screen where we did a retention test, which is somewhat unusual in some of these adaptation paradigms. Again, this is error on the y-axis. And then um, there's three groups. There's a group that gets 100% physical practice, 
A second group that gets half the amount of physical practice and rests in between. And a third group in yellow, again, that gets half the amount of physical practice and during those rest trials gets to observe somebody else. And we alternate um, every five trial blocks between physically practicing and observing. And what we showed here is that compared to the group who got the same amount of practice, that the, this mixed observation and physical practice where they're interspersed was beneficial for a retention. And that even though a group got twice as much physical practice uh, as them, there were no differences in terms of the retention. So um, we, we, we did make some claims about this sort of perhaps uh, observation might prevent some of this offline forgetting that happens over time. Okay, so I'm just going to move to the, the second part of this first question to do with uh, observation. Um, and th this is, uh, I've been interested in questions about what information we use to learn and also um, what information or what experiences allow us to make predictions about other people's actions. So when I was at Liverpool John Moores University, uh, I did a postdoc there with Mark Williams, and then I was a lecturer for a couple of years. We used a, a method of point light displays to manipulate information to try and see, hey, what's the important source of information when we're copying other people and trying to learn? And this is work with a number of people who you can see there. Um, and we were trying to look at sort of what is this minimal constraining information? And, and this was sort of a useful paradigm uh, to use. And we showed that people tended to um, orient themselves. We also did some eye movement research here, but towards the end effector, this, um, the information that gives you most information about the outcome. And that often just by having information about the end effector, maybe this is the throwing arm, they, they were able to, um, copy or fill in the blanks about other parts of the action. And so I think that question of like, what's the minimal information that you need to give people to learn is something that is worth considering because of course, too much information is just a, a source of interference. Uh, there was also some research I was involved with, with um, uh, Mark and Jamie and Nick Smeaton looking at uh, action anticipation and prediction. Sorry, the controls came up again. Let me just hide them. And I've continued to study action prediction. I think it's when somebody comes into the room, my controls keep coming up. That's okay. So um, I've continued to study action prediction uh, in, in my research at UBC. And we've used the temporal occlusion paradigm where individuals watch an action that unfolds over time and then is frozen at a particular point in time and individuals have to make a decision about what happens next. So uh, in one of our studies, we had um, dart players who were uh, pretty skilled at, the, at dart throwing and we compared them to people who were not skilled at dart throwing. And all they had to do is watch videos that were frozen at particular points in time and tell us whether the dart landed in the top or the middle or the bottom. Now our interest or my interest in particular here was how involved is the motor system in making these predictions? For a start, we have experts who have these motor experiences and novices who don't. Um, and I really wanted to try and probe the motor system involvement through the use of a secondary task. So as they were making these predictions, they had to lightly push against a force gauge with the right arm, which would have been the throwing arm. Um, and the idea behind this is that we are preventing the motor system from activating in a, in a covert fashion and, and obviously in an overt fashion as well by just lightly um, uh, monitoring a force um, with this arm, but the most important thing is was incompatible action to what they were seeing. So we, we uh, got individuals making these predictions and we found that if you interfere with the motor system, uh, the accuracy of the experts basically decreased to that of a novice level. So I'll show you some data here. This is percentage correct on the y-axis and these are data for novice and skilled individuals. They are not physically doing anything, they're just making predictions based on videos. And we have a control condition, we have a, 
an attention match control condition. Then we have this push, this motor incongruent task. And then we also had a, a congruent task where they were allowed to mimic as they were watching the action. The basic take home here is if you look at the novices, their accuracy was around about the same in all conditions, sort of 40 to 50%. If you look at the right side of the graph for the skilled individuals, they were more accurate in all conditions, except when we interfered with their motor system and the accuracy decreased to that level of the novice. So it suggests that the, the, when, when you're in this situation, you're just observing somebody else, but you actually are trying to make some predictions about what they're doing. The motor system is engaged in helping you uh, make those decisions if you have those experiences to start with. We didn't find any benefits from mimicking, but I do, I do want to flag here that uh, Sean Muller and uh, Hiroki Nakamoto in Japan, Sean Muller is in Australia, they have actually tried to use uh, paradigms where people are, are engaging in perceptual training for sports skills in cricket and basketball. And then they've got them to um, engage in some sort of mimicry of the action at the same time. And they have been showing some benefits for novices at least um, and relatively skilled cricket players for actually engaging the motor system in a congruent fashion as you're watching. So um, this was an expert novice design. So experts, of course, have visual experience as well as motor experiences. So we went on and tried to isolate those experiences that individuals had by doing um, a training design. And in, in our training design, we had three groups, one group that actually had physical practice, one group that only had perceptual training. So they watched videos, they made a prediction, we gave them feedback about their prediction and then they carried on. So they were just uh, training. So they should be picking up some cues about where the dart, um, how, um, sorry, the action is related to the dart outcome. And then we had a control group who didn't get any practice. So we were interested in the improvement from pre to post test. So this is on the y axis here. This is the percentage improvement from the pre to the post test. And then we have the physical practice group, the perceptual training group and the control group. And we had these uh, secondary task conditions, a control where they didn't do anything an attention control. And then we had them either pushing with their left arm, which was the non throwing arm that they're watching or pushing with the right arm. So if you just look at the physical practice group, we basically replicated our effects where only when they had to, to do an incongruent action was their interference in their predictions. This was for the physical practice group. For the perceptual training group, uh, they were slightly less accurate, but they didn't show this same um, interference from having to activate their motor system in an incongruent fashion. And the control group didn't show any improvements. So this training, physical practice, perceptual training, both work to improve performance, but there are different mechanisms involved. I, I did just want to just show you, this is some uh, newer research. It hasn't uh, even been submitted yet. But um, one of the th questions that we were interested in was whether um, the reason we see this right hand interference may be because the left hemisphere is involved in more of the planning. So we actually did this same uh, paradigm with left-handed throwers and we showed them the right-handed video and then we also flipped it so it made it look like the person was actually throwing with their left hand. This was actually Des throwing here. Um, and all I wanted just to show you here, again, this is percentage improvement from pre to post test. If they watched the right-handed video and they were left-handed throwers, we didn't see any improvement from pre to post test on any of the conditions. If they watched exactly the same video, this was actually a different group of individuals, exactly the same video that was flipped, then the data mirrored what we saw for the right-handed participants in that the only condition that, that interfered was when they actually had to push against the force gauge with the left hand. So stay tuned. So what I want to emphasize here is that these action experiences allow you, allow you to put yourself in the action to aid prediction. And there has been research showing that if you um, 
try and encourage a more sort of first person perspective, both for observational learning and in order to get more accurate predictions, then uh, people tend to do better because they're better able to put themselves in the action and simulate. So this was just some work from Ogesi and Agliotti in volleyball serving, showing that this back view perspective led to more accurate predictions or a bigger difference between athletes and fans than a front view perspective in terms of predictions. And I think this might have implications for how you go about um, training or getting people to learn from observation, maybe using helmet cameras or GoPro cameras. Uh, this is some uh, work from Des's um, master's thesis, different question, but he used these two different questions, two different viewpoints. Or even it's, you know, you can go and buy drones now. One of my current students um, ha has used a drone in some of his own soccer practice. Uh, so you can really get kind of a more immersive environment to try and aid training. We are doing some research to look at these different perspectives in more detail. And um, one of the questions that we're asking is how does motor experience impact prediction and perspective? And may there be some actual advantages of training people who are more visual experts um, to take on the role of the action expert? So this is the case of uh, the setter. So you can see the setter on the right-hand side here. So the setter is the action expert. And then the blocker is on the other side of the net and they have to anticipate what the setter is going to do. Are they gonna go straight up? Um, are they gonna go forward? Are they gonna go back? In order that they can make um, a fast decision. And we've shown individuals in volleyball, this work with Matt Kruger, this um, behind the net, the blocker's view, as well as the setter's view in this first person. And we've also uh, made sure that there's an action response that's coupled as they're making these predictions and we've changed the map sequence. So they're either in a horizontal line or they're actually moving forward and back. Now this research has been interrupted by uh, COVID. So we've only collected data so far on a few setters and blockers, uh, but we do have some evidence that these, the setters, these action experts are more accurate than the blockers. So these, these are both highly skilled volleyball players. UBC has a great volleyball team. Um, and then there seems to be some advantage at occlusion, at early occlusion points. So at ball contact, both groups are doing very well, um, over 80% accuracy. Then it drops off as there's less information available. This is accuracy on the y-axis, and this is chance at 33%. And there's, there's um, at least for these middle occlusion frames, it seems that the action experts uh, have an advantage over the people that have uh, this visual expertise. Uh, so we need to go and look at, to see whether the, the perspective and the map setup actually matters. And like I say, it's early data. We, we've only tested a couple of novices and, and we're really just trying to validate some of these um, images at the moment. But this, this is encouraging. And we're hoping that this may actually have some implications for training. So just to finish up, I want to talk quickly about the developmental practice experiences which best describe and predict sports success. Uh, I've been influenced by uh, some of Jean Cote's uh, research to do with the developmental model of sport participation and questions to do with specialization, the relation between practice play and motivation, and then some more recent research looking at how we can assess readiness um, for, for engagement in deliberate practice. So this started when I went out to uh, McMaster University to work with Janice Starks, who, who, who was the leading expert on expertise at the time. And uh, I uh, ended up going there in 93, Ericsson released his uh, deliberate practice paper and Janet was on it and said, look, we have these wrestlers uh, at UBC, let's do some research to test some of these ideas. So that was um, um, great to be involved in that research at the time. And then I, then I wasn't really doing any deliberate practice research until uh, David Hendry came to join my lab and we, we picked up the developmental model of sport participation and thought, hey, we've got some questions to ask here um, concerning specialization, diversity and motivation. And 
you know, is, is it really harmful to be engaged in early practice experiences? So the design we used, which was a sort of prospective follow-up, is that David did this research with academy players in Scotland, and he tested them from the ages of about 13 to 15, and then followed them up um, two or three years later when they would receive a youth professional contract at the age of 16. And then again, two years later, when they would receive um, an adult professional contract around about the age of 19. And then we looked to see who were successful and then went back and looked at their childhood practice activities. And this data here just says we, we were interested in the number of sports they were engaging in. <clears throat> and uh, these soccer players during childhood were doing quite a lot of other sports. So they all showed diverse sport involvement, but it was the ones who didn't progress who actually um, were engaged or show a trend anyway to be engaged in more sports than the ones that did progress. You know, so and that's in some ways not surprising. There's probably a limit in the amount of time that you can spend doing other things that will take away from the time in the majority sport. And this has led, uh, I know myself and and Paul Ford to to talk about um, um, majority uh, engagement, early engagement pathway, majority time early engagement pathway. <clears throat> um, in, in that same study, we looked at how uh, there were, if there were differences in practice and play hours between the ones that went on to get a professional contract at 16 or 19 years of age. <clears throat> so this is their play and practice hours, so team practice, what we called self-directed play, but this was actually any activity outside of team practice. So it could be, could be um, individual practice as well. And we could differentiate these individuals. So it's so it's predictive. Um, the, the ones who they're all really skilled, they're in an academy system, but the ones that actually get professional contract, these are in blue, uh, engaged in more hours of practice. And if you look at the orange bars in terms of play, um, these adult professional, uh, the ones who actually got a professional contract at adult years during child, childhood and engaging more self-directed play. So this could be individual practice, and that meshes really well with what Ericsson said, this self-directed practice is really important, or it could just be um, anything to do with just um, picking up the ball and, and going to play with teammates or um, schoolmates. We have transitioned some of this research uh, to study women's soccer. Uh, we compared uh, individuals who were playing on the Canada national team to to varsity athletes. And in Vancouver, the UBC varsity team is, is extremely successful. And a lot of these athletes are on the same pathways to the national team athletes. Um, when we looked at their practice hours, there wasn't any difference between the national and the varsity hours. But we also asked them to, to uh, recall those that they, that when they were in environments that they thought was medium high challenge. And when we actually tried to sort of get more at deliberate practice, uh, through ratings of challenge, then in blue here, this is the practice hours, the national and varsity during childhood and on the right during adolescence, um, the national team players that engaged in more high challenge practice during childhood and adolescence. And they'd also engaged in more play in, in uh, these red bars during childhood and ad adolescence in the varsity. Um, but it was so low in comparison to what the, the boys had been doing um, in soccer. And I think maybe this reflects some of the constraints that have been there in the past. I think there's, I know my girls play soccer, but they don't play soccer at school. Uh, there's difficulty getting hold of the ball. They might get ridiculed by, by some of the boys. Um, I think there's less chance for street soccer. We live on a hill, so it's difficult anyway. So I, I'm... I'm curious about how perhaps some of these um, out of practice, out of formal practice activities have actually changed across the years. So just to finish, we, we just launched, launched a study in uh, early this year, perhaps not the best timing with COVID, um, but we want to study girls' soccer pathways. And this is a longitudinal project designed to look at um, time in soccer activities, time in other sport and um participation 
And as well as measuring uh, behaviors and interests and motivations, and we have a deliberate practice questionnaire to try and also get at um, how engaged they are in practice, that questions like, uh, when I practice, um, I, I try and take what the coach says and apply it to my own individual skills versus um, when I get to practice, I like it when I don't have to think too much, you know, those kinds of questions. And we're collecting yearly data on the adolescent girls soccer to study factors related to these successful transitions. So I'm just going to show you a quick uh, video from this project. It's only 30 seconds if this works. I'm Izzy, and I'm taking part in this study to contribute to the development of girls. You might need to change your share screen to um, with okay. on YouTube. Programs across the country. We want to better understand why girls play soccer. Thank you. I'm Izzy, and I'm taking oh. part in this study to contribute. <laughs> uh. yeah. I'm Izzy, and I'm taking part in this study to contribute to the development of girls and women's soccer in Canada. We need your help too. Along with Canada Soccer and other clubs and programs across the country, we want to better understand why girls play soccer, as well as what motivates them to progress to higher levels of play. The overall aim is to improve the female soccer experience in BC and Canada. By filling out our online survey with information like how much you practice, what other sports and non-sport activities you do, we can learn a lot. This yearly paid survey provides us with long-term insights into what leads to the successful conversion of athletes, so we know how to better support you. Head on over to the website or send us an email to learn more and help women's soccer in Canada grow stronger than ever. So I, I wanted to show that because I think that really um, uh, underscores some of the initiatives that are happening in Ireland at the moment. And I think actually across the world, I know the UK has similar initiatives and in Canada too. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm gonna finish up there then. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank my student co-authors, um, especially uh, Des, Nicole and David and April who have mentioned in this talk, they're gonna kill me for putting that picture up. And uh, the current Motor Skills Lab, Georgia, Joe, um, Kerry, Samia, Anna, Michael, Matt. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me and listening. Right, thanks, Nikki. Um, we're gonna go straight over to questions. So uh, Phil, we've had a couple come through on Zoom. So over to yourself. We have, thank you. So uh, just to say to begin with, uh, that was fantastic to see such a range of research from really cleverly designed motor control experiments through to, to expertise research that spans, you know, uh, 15 years worth of, of experiences, fantastic range. Our first question uh, comes from Dovrig and I'm just going to, uh, apologies now, I've lost my participants. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, call on, on Dovrig so she can answer or ask the question herself or himself. Uh, I've just asked you to unmute there. There we go. Over to you. Uh, hi, uh, Nicola. Uh, just want to ask, uh, in terms of the challenge point framework, how would autonomy affect the opt optimal challenge? As you would assume a training session with autonomous elements would remain within the suboptimal challenge because it'll be in the player's comfort zones. Yeah, I, I actually think, um, <laughs> not, these are just my thoughts, but um, yeah, so I think there are probably constraints around self-control practice. Um, so you can give autonomy to individuals, but it doesn't have to be, hey, do whatever you want. So you can give challenges that are within an optimal challenge zone, if we want to call it that, and then they can have some choice, but they still could be challenging choice. Um, you know, I, and I think if you look at some of the self-controlled research, it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms how on how 
effective it is. Um, so, um, and, and maybe some of that reason is that that there perhaps needs to be, you know, you need to be engaged, perhaps engaging in some deliberate practice to even know what um, good practice is. And maybe, you know, if you're not really ready to learn, if you're just showing up, if you're more of a passive participant, then that doesn't mean that you're going to choose the best practice conditions. So I think there's lots of ways that you can bring autonomy into practice, but still try and keep that challenge at an optimal level, if that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so before I pass over some of the questions that are coming into YouTube, I just want to, to ask one of myself for myself as well, which um, comes from a slide that really stood out for me as, as a, a really striking slide, uh, which was the last one on uh, the, the developmental experiences of women soccer players and the virtual absence of play from their developmental history. So could you perhaps comment on, you know, what is it that players are likely to be missing out on from having not had that, that history of play? Yeah, it, it is really striking. And actually, um, uh, David always says to me when I present that data, I talk about the, the differences between the national and the varsity players in terms of um, play hours, because it is statistically significant, yet it's so small in comparison um, to what we are seeing in, in the boys and the men. Now, some of this is gets to the definition of how you measure play, and there has been some discrepancies across some of the studies. But yeah, I do think that there's, um, yeah, there, there's experiences that are being missed out on, especially if you more subscribe to some of the constraints that learning and this discovery play that happens in childhood where, um, you know, nobody's telling you what to do, nobody's correcting you, uh, that really you're just um, learning to uh, do whatever you can to score or to get hold of the ball. And so maybe that's, this has implications on um, toughness, confidence. I mean, it's hard to know. I, I will say one other thing is that uh, Paul, uh, Paul Ford, uh, had done um, study with some international players from other countries. And I think Canada and the US actually looked quite low on the play scale, but I think it was the, U the, the England team that actually had more hours of play. So I think that's encouraging that maybe there's either less formal structure in the UK, which, so they're playing catch up to what's been happening in North America. And so maybe it's reflective of these really sort of formal structures. But, you know, I, I don't know. I suppose we have to look at see who the, the most successful teams are in the world. And it's still, at the moment at least, I would say the USA, uh, obviously England are up there and, and Canada is competing too. Um, stay tuned, I suppose, and let's see if that happens. But I, I really would be curious to know how, how you can actually try and get people engaging in more play. I, you know, And really what are the... What are, what are we going to see for the benefits on that? Perfect, thank you. Thanks, Phil. So I'm just going to jump in here, if you don't mind, Nikki, with a, a question from Vladislav from YouTube. And he's looking to see if you can share some practical examples uh, when it comes to the facilitation of active watching for motor learning. Yes, yeah, I, I often um, I reflect on this and I, I try to do it a little bit in the talk. Um, but I do think... Standing up, for instance, you know, if you're watching somebody do an action, I don't think you should be sitting down. Um, there's, I don't know if there's research actually showing that your motor system is more activated when you're standing. Um, maybe that's something that I should look at. Uh, but I, but um, as much as you can, you want an immersive environment. So uh, full size screen. Um, now and again, consider these other uh, viewpoints so that you're in this first vert first person viewpoint, maybe the camera is from above and behind. This is where I think drones could be really useful during games so that you, rather than you've got following the players from the side, that actually you've got this more in the action um, environment. Maybe even as a coach player, you could wear a little camera uh, on your head to sort of give this idea of, you know, where, you, where you're looking, where you're head checking um, and what, what people are actually doing in the environment. Um, there, I mean, there is uh, TMS evidence, I know this is not practical, that when individuals watch from a first person perspective, that the motor system is uh, more engaged in terms of if you look at muscle output, 
from the first person versus this um, third person or mirrored viewpoint. So I think just mixing it up basically. And also, again, this hasn't really received a lot of attention yet, but I think giving people physical experiences of the thing they're watching, if you try and do that, so you don't wanna just have a whole period of just watching as much as possible, if you can intersperse observation with physical experiences, I think also this is gonna to lead to more activation of the motor system as well. Lovely stuff. So we've uh, another question that came in from email beforehand, and it's a bit of a, a broader question. Um, in terms of what it is that skill acquisition uh, specialists can do, what they can offer to a team in terms of enhancing their performance. So what would you see as the, the recommendations, the role of a skill acquisition specialist? And that one comes in from uh, Mohamed Bila. Oh, that's an interesting question. Thanks, Mohammed. You know, I, I, I must admit for many years, I, I hid in my lab and, uh, you know, had occasional talks with, with the varsity coaches um, and of my colleagues about sports at conferences. But it wasn't until about five years ago, I think it was about five years ago, that the um, national um, women's team coach, John Herman at the time, asked me to come and do some consultancy with the women's soccer team. And I was extremely nervous I think what do I have to say to especially you know elite athletes already so we're not really looking at these learning processes at the same level but um there was there was a lot to say so I, I think really the role of the skill acquisition specialist is to observe and apply the knowledge that they have and both from the psychology and the experimental research and the neuroscience research um, to the situation at hand. So um, if it's anything to do with, you know, one of the things they wanted to know was like, okay, just say we, we have a back-to-back -back game, we lose. How should we prepare for the next game tactically in terms of giving people information where we have new players, there's going to be a new team formation, new tactics, you know, and so trying to draw on um, knowledge to do with, um, how people learn from instructions, how memory works, processes of consolidation, um, and really just sitting back and observing and providing both evidence-based knowledge, but also as I was encouraged to just, you know, what, what do I think? What's my opinions? Um, so I think as a skill acquisition specialist, your role is not to be the coach, um, but to question. And when people are doing things to look to see why are they doing that and what would be the mechanism behind it? And could, the, could you draw out some principles that, that you're using in this situation that you should be using in that situation? Like for example, transfer. Um, we know a lot about encoding specificity that the situations of practice should match those of competition. So, you know, they, in a warm up for a game, it, it's all very well if you want to warm up with music and the relaxed atmosphere to get people relaxed. But you have to know if that's your goal to just get people relaxed and warm up, that's one thing. But is your goal to transfer to the game situation the next day where you're going to be super anxious and there's going to be loud noise? And, you know, then I think it changes your, your um, perspective on how you might want to do the, the pre-game warm up if you're really considering some of those mechanisms. I think um, just to jump in on top of that, um, do you think in terms of half-time behaviours and players who are warming up to come on as a substitute, that again, it has a role to be played there in terms of how we speed up their readiness to transition to the game? It, it could do. I, I, I must admit, I, you know, I, I, unfortunately, John Herman ended up taking over the job at the men's um, national team. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I never got involved in those halftime talks. And I suppose that's always been seen as more of the domain of the sports psychologist. But, you know, my undergrad degree is in psychology. So sometimes separating the experimental psychology and skill acquisition part from the psychology is, is an artificial one uh, occasionally, but you can't be expert in everything. Um, so I, I know a bit about some of the psychology, but I think then that's where you would be wanting to work probably with a sports psychologist in tandem as part of that support, uh, science, sports science support team. Perfect, thank you very much. I think we might have a question from uh, Ed now. Let's 
Hi guys, sorry Nikki, I just had to uh, take off my video um, because I think it was impacting on my the quality of sound. I have a, I do, I have a question, and I think the you, you mentioned about the work yourself and Paul Paul Ford, who obviously was one of my supervisors, um, about majority time early engagement pathway, and <laughs> it piqued my interest, and I'd love to hear more, even if just a brief description about what what you guys were looking at or are still looking at in that area of majority time dash early engagement pathway for the development of athletes in conjunction with what you were talking about with with Jean Cote's DMSP model. Yes yeah thanks for that Ed. Um, so yeah uh, Paul uh, um, well Paul Ford and, and Mark Williams and also um, Paul Ward uh, early on um, came up with this idea that of, of an early engagement pathway um, as different to sort of a one that's fully based on sampling and then late specialization or specialization where you're only really doing one sport. And some of this is a bit definitional. Um, in our research, we've been showing that individuals start early and not only do they start early, but at least in some of the work that I've done with David Hendry over the years, they, they spend the majority of their time in their primary sport as well. That doesn't mean they're not doing other sports, but there's this early majority engagement. So, you know, um, and I've been back and forth with Mark and, and Paul about including the word majority in there. They, they don't want to complicate it. So they just call it the early engagement pathway, which is fine. But I think what's now it, it could be sport dependent, but definitely in our research, um, they, they're, these players are doing lots of other things, but the majority of the time is spent in soccer. And, you know, um, in these sports, particularly that have high participation and it's highly competitive, it would be hard, I think, to make up a deficit unless you start early accumulating these practice experiences. In, and, and it doesn't actually have to be just informal practice. I mean, as the data shows, these could be in self-led practice experiences as well. Although it does seem that formal practice experiences are still distinguishing those who make it from those who do not. And, you know, there's so many variables in there. It depends how good the formal ex practice experiences are. Um, so, yeah, we just, we didn't like this, this dichotomy that was initially proposed. And I, I don't think Jean Cote meant to do this and he's actually had a huge impact on the field. So I'm not um, criticizing the model. But I think it's more just getting a, a refined idea about what specialization may actually mean. It doesn't have to mean exclusive participation. And that's where we use the term early engagement. Does that help? I, I, I do remember at the time, I do remember at the time Paul was talking about with the, that paper, the early engagement hypothesis paper that, they, that I think you guys published. And he was saying that there was there was some very good conversations between himself and and Anders Ericsson, who you mentioned previously, and but it also it also spoke to that idea of, you know, how 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 much and how how much and how soon and how often and so on and so forth. But I think even you have work yourself, and I know Phil has work about that, the that that look at you know what what makes a junior athlete successful doesn't always turn out to make that senior athlete successful, and I think that that can also feed into this conversation that the best juniors don't always uh, transfer into a, a senior status athlete, which again, as you said, there's so many contributing variables to this, but I think there is, there's some of that nice research that you guys are, are have already contributed to. Yeah, and I think Ar Arne Gulich is doing some work and, and some of the data looks different to ours. And I, I think they propose that maybe when we are looking at youth athletes, we're getting a different picture from the adult athletes. Um, we haven't shown that in our data yet, but that's not to say, um, you, you know, that we, that who is right or wrong at the moment. I mean, you can only talk to what you get in your data. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're paying attention to what else is out there and then continuing, continuing to ask questions. And we probably need to look across different domains. So I do have a student at the moment who we're going to start doing some um, longitudinal work with people who play baseball, which is a, a, a much more um, specific type of skill. We're looking at anticipation and prediction too, but trying to uh, tie this to their diverse, diversity of sport experiences, as well as their specific sport experiences 
batting and um, pitching. Uh, but yes, I, I think um, there there is potentially um, some issues there about who the population you're looking at. I mean, we have looked at women elite players, but most of our research has been with those who have only made it to, you know, age 19 adult elite. You know, still in the Scottish Premiership, quite significant. We've got time for one last question. So, uh, Phil, we've got a question from Dave Bright, I see. We have, yeah. So we've got a question from Dave Bright with his... his his coach hat on, I, I suspect, as well as his scientist hat on. Um, and so he's asking, do you think it's the job of the scientists to tell the coach about what they can provide or the job of the coach to ask questions of the scientists? <laughs> That's a nice question to end on. Um, both. Of course, I'm going to say both. Uh, you know, I, um, yes, I think there's a lot we can learn. We're, I'm actually doing a, a study with a, a couple of students at the moment and Joe Baker where we're, we're actually just trying to learn from the coaches about what approaches they use to train and assess perceptual cognitive skills in sport. Um, and uh, the aim is really to say, well, this is what we know, is that being applied? But what are people doing and how can we test the evidence? And I think that bi-directional relationship is, is super important. You guys are doing a great job at, at trying to um, encourage that. Obviously, uh, Rob Gray with his podcast, um, is really trying to do that knowledge bridging and learning from both perspectives. So um, I think I think that's we're we're at a fantastic time in terms of skill acquisition and sport and coaches talking to each other, which is which is great. And not only that, many coaches are becoming skill acquisition specialists too. And uh, you know I've had an influx of people from the strength and conditioning realm who want to come and learn more about skill acquisition. So it's been really really uh, good for me I think to get me a bit outside of the lab and thinking more about application that's great I think that's a real great statement to, to end on the the transfer between the the stuff that you see in research and, and maybe some of the more applied in from the practitioners so yeah it's great to hear that, that um, people are coming and seeking out your expertise um, Nikki, I just want to, for, on behalf of MSAI, I'd just like to thank you for your time today, sharing with us your, your research and experiences. Um, yeah, there's so much content in there, so definitely uh, we'll be checking that out again on, on YouTube and replay. Um, to all of you who watched on YouTube and on, on Zoom, thanks for tuning in. Um, pleasure to, to, to host you. And just, uh, just one for your diaries, we're going to uh, go with our next episode really um really quite quickly so uh, I'll just flash this up on the screen um, our next episode our next uh, yeah episode uh, the third in the series is on Tuesday and we've got Dr Laura Finnegan who's going to talk about her, her really quite important research on talent development in Irish football um, so if you keep an eye on our Twitter feed we will post the registration link very very shortly um, uh, this evening um, so keep an eye on that uh, and uh, get signed up Okay, so that's, that's everything from us. Again, thanks for joining in. Uh, thanks for Nicola for her time and I hope everybody has a great weekend. Bye.